five, four, three, two, one. And welcome to What the Shuck. The goal of the What the Shuck podcast is to provide a platform for those people with positive and influential ideas that have helped me to change my life and also that are going to help you to navigate the tribulations that life will throw you while you're trying to achieve your biggest goals. However, I also plan to put a spotlight on the people who made Kentucky such a unique and awesome place. So throughout my podcast, I will be interviewing people of all professions, arts, and honestly just anyone with a cool idea or story that should be heard. My next guest is a gun-loving, craft beer chugging, bean roasting, open micer. He has one of the sickest beards in the game and is the owner of Smoking Aces and Jefferson Street Coffee. My next guest is Mr. David Barnes. Thanks for coming on, man. You're welcome, man. Glad to have you. Um, so we're in his shop right now on Jefferson Street, and this place is awesome. Um, I was actually introduced to Mr. Barnes through West Main Crafting Company. He provides all of our coffee there. And uh, he would just always be bringing in cold brew, and I'd start talking to him. I was like, "This is super cool." So, it was a uh, that's been a super cool thing that I haven't actually got to talk talk or touch on very much with the podcast is how much networking I've got to do at West Main, and how much just getting to meet cool people in the industries around Kentucky. Uh, and you do some really cool stuff, so I just wanted to bring you on. So thanks, man. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the uh, undervalued aspects of being a small business owner. Um, one of the best things for me, I think, is being able to connect directly with people. And uh, I'd be crazy if I got into this game like thinking I was going to get rich. <laughs> but the uh, the connections and the people that I've met along the way have been uh, kind of what's made me stick with it. So, Yeah, man, and I feel like that's what's so cool to me is that um, it's just been – a really cool introduction to all of the industries in the area that I was not familiar with. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I think that I was walking at, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was actually before I met you at West Main, but I was at a cold brew fest at uh-huh, the yeah. pavilion and I was like checking out all these coffees and I came <laughs> up to this one and there, these people were like, oh, the flavor notes are like... Uh, orange Tootsie Pop and I was like alright like that sounds really good like throw some cream in that and that's literally like yeah. that sounds like money and just a little bit not, not too much but and um, then I tried it and I was like I was jacked dude I was like feeling good I was like I, it was right when I started working out I just lost a bunch of weight and yeah. I was like feeling good and I was like oh man if I have this stuff I don't even need Cobra or I don't even need pre-workout and I legitimately went to Whole Foods and got a cold press or like a press and everything because I liked your coffee so much. That's awesome. And I was just like, dude. And then, <laughs> and then when I got to West Main, and I was like, what? This is the coffee we use? I was like, let's go. And then I got. I to remember. Meet you, uh, so. I remember how pumped you were. Um, one of the days, I think when you first started there, and I made a, a delivery or something. And you were like, oh, my God, we're using your coffee. I Dude, like, I was yeah, so man. I was like, I know you. And you were like, my name's Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of really good coffee in Lexington. Uh, but what we've done right out of the gate, I think, is just ensure that we're, we're spending uh, more on average on our materials that we're getting for coffee. So it's, it's the, the coffee itself is inherently better. Um, you know, and obviously, putting it through the roasting process and stuff like that, after you have your profiles nailed down, it's, it's more about repetition and, you know, consistency. Uh, but if you, it's impossible to take bad coffee that you paid very little for and make it into high quality coffee. So you, it all depends on what you start with. And, you know, you kind of probably see that with your the, the bartending deal uh, behind the bar with, um, you know, the ingredients you guys are using in your cocktails. You can't take poor ingredients and make like a great cocktail or something that's going to be memorable at least. So. And that was like, that's the whole reason we make most of our ingredients in house. Like I think like cranberry juice might be one of the only things I can think of that we don't make in house because we're not going <laughs> to squeeze a bunch of cranberries, yeah. but yeah, but Jake would if he had. He would. Know. I think he would if it wasn't so just tedious. Yeah. But I mean, because we squeeze our own lemons, limes, mm-hmm. and grapefruits every single day. We make our own simple syrup. We make our own bitters. Like it's just because he knew that that was going to be the exact quality that he wanted, and he wasn't going to accept anything less than that. Yeah. And that's, well, I guess, the same thing with you. And I can remember I was like, "What made you want to get into this?" If you want to elaborate on that, because obviously you actually just answered one of the questions I wanted to ask was that. Why do you think that your coffee shop, like, what do you, like, what's your goal with this and what do you want to be set apart? But you kind of actually just answered it with that. So 
if you'd want to just give an introduction to like why you wanted to get into roasting to begin yeah. with. Yeah. So I don't, um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of great coffee in Lexington, and I don't feel like what we're doing with uh, the, the coffee shop or the roastery aspect of the business is uh, reinventing the wheel. It'd be kind of pointless, you know. Uh, there have been some um, some new things in coffee as far as the growing and the practices and how it's harvested and, you know, the, the quality of the bean and ensuring that the pickers are picking the correct bean at the right time during the whatever point in harvest. And so, but coffee itself is, um, it's, it's finite. It's, it can only be so good. You know, and then at that point, it's like, well, how much do you really want to pay for it? It's kind of like the Pappy Van Winkle and whiskey. It's like, well, this is the same shit that's in all these other bottles. Why is it 17 times the cost? So, um, I got into coffee because of the depth and how, um, it's just a, rabbit hole after rabbit hole you know mm. you think once you know something about a specific bean or a specific origin and then all of a sudden some new information kind of comes along and like blows your mind and you're like everything i thought i knew was wrong <laughs> um i love when that stuff happens though seriously absolutely and it well, it, it kind of keeps it fresh and, and um keeps you on your toes too yeah so it's uh it's it's vast um the best analogy for coffee would be wine so you know from the the uh, cultivation of the plant, how long the plant has to be in the ground before it starts to yield uh, actual fruit. And then the first couple of years it does start to yield fruit. Uh, it's it's kind of not good, you know, it's not its best. Um, so you have those heirloom plants that you continue to pick. And then once the plant has given all it can, it's like, well, let's, there's a, like a constant rotation of new plants and that kind of thing. Um, but wine would be the best analogy. And you know how deep wine can get. And how crazy people are about uh, red wine, specifically dry reds. Um, so yeah, that that kind Definitely. of attracted me to it. Um, but that's the, something I'm actually working on getting to know better. I, that that's one of my be lists. prepared. <laughs> yes, because I know there's so many people who walk in, and I definitely am familiar with the wines we have. But like outside of that, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and it's. I kind of always say, at least with coffee, you know, kind of stick to what you know, especially mm. if you're trying to provide a product that's going to be consistent. Um, obviously, in your uh, in your R and D time, um, you know, reach out and explore and try to find something new and try to learn something new about maybe a different origin or a different farm or a different practice or a different process or something like that. Um, but until you really know that really well, uh, it's very hard to present that to a customer and, ex and try to sell them something. You're like, well, I don't really know a lot about this coffee, but we roasted it. We think we got it all right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it tastes okay. You know, we want to try to show them the best of what we know. Mm -hmm. so. and, and that's an important thing that we stress where we work, where I work too, is just that you can provide a good cup of coffee and you can provide a, um, memory, like it, it can be a cool ambiance, but it's like, are you providing a great service that's going to educate them right. and make them be passionate about it and not just be like, hey, this is a cup of coffee. It's like, hey, I want to give you a true experience. Like, this is not only going to be a good cup of coffee and in a cool ambiance, but it's going to be an awesome coffee where we're going to literally drop, like, knowledge bombs on you and make you, like, like I said, the whole yeah. reason that I literally went and got your all's coffee at Whole Foods was because I was like, like, they just told me so much cool stuff that I would have never <laughs> known about. Like, everybody yeah. else was like, oh, yeah, this yeah. is our... This is what this flavor, or this is like what this is called, and that was it. But you were like step by step by step yeah. by step, and I was like, all right, this is awesome. So. It's kind of, um, and that's the difference between when you get like I'm just a guy, like yeah, it's a business, or you know, yeah, we're opening a coffee shop, but I'm just a guy. So in order for me to connect, like the best thing that I can do uh, to help people, and especially in Lexington, is you know we're a very undereducated coffee market, um, so. When we put a product on the shelf and we say, hey, you know, this is $15 for a 12-ounce bag of coffee, um, some people don't get that. And then they, they look at the comparables like, well, it's not comparable. It's half the price like Folgers. You get a pound and a half or two pounds for $8. Uh, in all reality, for Folgers to sell that to somebody, someone's getting stepped over, you know. But for me as a guy, I can say, hey, here's why you're paying this, you know, for this Mm -hmm. like a retail product or the retail price um and so it's a it's an opportunity to educate uh, and let them know why they're paying what they're paying uh but then they also get to take something away like they have some information going well that guy so and so told me that this is the reason that this is this way and so on and so forth and um they have a connection with you and that's kind of 
hey, I'll shell out another five or six bucks, you know, because I, I know that guy. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think that's why craft the craft beer scene is so cool around here and the craft cocktail is expanding around here is because it's like, all right, we're going to give you this cool drink, but also, like, it's going to be, like, when I go into, like, West Six or, like, Ethereal, like, they're like, what's up, Austin? And I'm just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's either a good or a bad thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm going there too often, Absolutely. but it's just like, it's cool to be like, these are my people. I can talk to them and they like relate to me. And it's yep. like, I am willing to shell out a couple more dollars because it's a craft quality. I can, t- I can literally taste like the art in it. Yeah. It's an art, like what they're doing. And same with your coffee. Like it's just, it's. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's worth the, for me, like you said, it's worth the, like just the engagement. Mm-hmm. That's really what it is. It's yep. like just the engagement is worth the, the it's entertainment almost. Yeah, the knowledge, the familiarity. Um, let's see. There's people walking by. <laughs> Some lady literally, like, I swear she's probably doing 40 miles an hour, pulls into the parking lot the other day, and I'm standing in the parking lot. Like, obviously, we're not open yet. And she gets out of her car. She's like, slams the brakes in the parking lot, jumps out of her car, runs to the front door. And I didn't even have a chance to, like, make it around. And she sees me uh, when I go back out around the other side of the parking lot. And she's like, hey, are you guys open? And I was like, not yet. And she's like, I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. She doesn't even care when we're open. She's like, I'll be back when you're open. Um, but yeah, going back to what you were saying before, I did a, a small little interview. It's like a 10-question thing for the scout guide a couple years ago. And they asked me uh, what it meant to me uh, to be like a local business or like why that, I felt that was important. And I think the biggest takeaway from that for me was the fact that you have an opportunity to engage with the person that owns the business. And as a consumer, that means a lot to me as an individual. Yeah, regardless, of, regardless of what it means to most other people that are going to be buying your product, they're going to be a, a large percentage that don't care about that, and they're going to be a large percentage that do. Um, but it, it, I would rather, it, almost for any service, like you know a guy that does HVAC work, you know a guy that does electric, um, you're more apt to call the guy that you know versus calling like a business or like a corporation. So if you are buying Folgers or Maxwell house or whatever, insert any other big brand name there, that money just goes into the abyss. But when you know the guy and you know that they're going to take that and like continue to create and grow this other product, that's like really close to home. And it's obviously influential, not only to the the city that you're in, but the culture and the people that are around you too. Um, there's a little bit more of a, it's like an unspoken, unseen value add. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, I'd, well, I'd rather give that guy my money than than some corporation that's going to just probably avoid paying taxes with it. You just yeah. see the true influence. Like, it's yeah. literally not just that it's a cup of coffee. It's like that's going to put tires on that person's car, or like right. a roof Absolutely. over their head, and you're yeah. not just like, oh, this is some corporate overlord that's, yeah. like you said, not going to pay taxes or yeah. get like some way to shit on the common man. It's like, and honestly, it's just the taste is just so much better. Like, it's. It's like I'm willing to to I don't know. I'm willing to work harder to spend more money to give that person the opportunity to work harder and make more money coming to my local yeah. uh, like just the commerce is like good for everybody in the area. Yeah. So I'm willing to work harder and that's important yeah. like I don't care to work harder to help someone else because I appreciate their craft. It's important. Yeah, you can you can call it and that's another probably the main reason I guess I got into coffee. Um, it, it, you can call it being like bougie or being hipster or whatever, but it's tough, man. Once you have like a really great cup of coffee to go back and drink shitty coffee. Yes. And it's like, wait, this isn't even, it's, it's marginally more expensive. Sometimes it's not more expensive. There's really bad coffee out there. That's the same price point as what we put on the show. Mm-hmm. And that's like, I'm being kind of harsh when I say that, but, um, Generally, what happens if a brand kind of grows and they get outside of themselves, they end up falling victim to like they're at the mercy of the system that they've created. So if their labor costs are too high or if some line item in their um, in their expense sheet is too high, they end up having to the only thing that they can do is sacrifice quality to increase their margins. Mm -hmm. And that's fortunately, that's one thing we haven't had to do. Um, We pay our margins are good as long as we keep our costs down. Um, but one thing that we'll never do is sacrifice the quality so that we can kind of pay our bills. At that point, we've kind of lost our way, and it's something um, something way worse is like 
behind the scenes going on, if that mm. makes sense. You know? Yeah, I mean... You, Something's well, awry. The whole reason <laughs> you even got into it was because the integrity of the, the, the craft. So, like, if you, like, would be willing to sacrifice that integrity then you know you're literally like why am i even still doing this like yeah I, I've, this is what the whole reason i got into this was yeah. because an inferior product was being made and i knew i could do something better right so. and i consider myself like um i really value experiences um if there's something that i haven't tried i'm always willing to like oh well, let's go do that or let's taste that or um you know do this new thing and uh I, you know what's crazy is that while those things are fun i feel like i learn more about myself that way um, and coffee was one of those things that when I had what I call my aha cup where I'm like, holy shit, what have I been drinking all my life? And why has it not been this? And what's different here? Um, it really made me question a lot of things. Um, but having someone like myself who seeks those experiences out and welcomes them. And then when I found coffee, I was like, if I'm just now finding out about this, there are probably a lot of other people that don't know that coffee <laughs> can be like this too. Yeah. Then there might be uh, an opportunity for like, you know, education and, um, you know, the knowledge, sharing knowledge with people, connecting with people. And those are all my favorite things. So when you look at the business, the business is like the um, what, but it's not the why. Mm -hmm. I didn't get into coffee because I wanted to be a businessman or, a, or own a coffee shop. I got into it for the people and the ability to like share something with other people that I created and, and worked really hard on. So, I think that the why is always the most important too. Is like so, I feel like so many times, like you said, people will just be like, "Why did you want to do that?" It's like because I wanted to own a restaurant or I wanted to own a coffee shop. Yeah, and in those like, in those instances, and in, in my experience, and call it anecdotal, if you will, um, those are operations that aren't sustainable. Yes, and I completely. You know? I also call it anecdotal, but I completely agree. Yeah, just from yeah. seeing it, yeah, it's your passion will run out if you don't wholeheartedly have a why. Oh, if your why is literally just because coffee, then you're going to be like, I hate coffee at the end of the day. <laughs> because you don't make any money. You're yeah. like, I have to work these two fucking jobs yeah. to, to keep like, to pay my rent and like exactly. coffee's not doing anything for me and it becomes more of a drain or, or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, but far too often you see people that, um, especially in Lexington, uh, because Lexington doesn't have, I guess, per capita, the number of restaurants that some other similar sized cities have. But, people that have a little bit of money to invest or that can talk other people into giving them a little money or maybe put like a little team together and they're like, oh man, if we just open this biscuit restaurant, like we're going to be rolling in money. And then six months down the road when they're still broke and like fighting to pay their bills and, and everything, it's just adding all this stress. If you're not passionate about it, pull the plug. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what ends up happening. So you see all these restaurants close down. A lot of them get kind of um, underwater really quickly and can't, you know, swim back to the top but um yeah but the people that are passionate um those businesses stay around and sustain you know yeah and I mean? i and and as an accountability thing that's why i want to do this podcast is i want people to be able to come on here and be like oh i remember when i was talking about this and i want to make sure i do that because that's out on the airwaves like people are listening to this like yeah. and and it's even for myself like just having myself be like what my goals are and what I want to do and like why I want to do what I want to do is important because I have the guidance to be like, I said this, so I need to make sure I make it happen because now my name's on the line, I'm putting this on my podcast and these people are coming on here and like, I want to make sure I do right by the people I have on my podcast. So like, it's just really important to constantly be holding myself accountable to making sure that I'm not being lazy during an interview or I'm not like putting out shitty content that no one wants to listen to. I want to actually put out stuff that helps people be better. And I want to help people yeah, to yeah. believe in themselves or to be like, all right, like I want to start a business. Maybe there's a guy somewhere else that's like maybe not at a grocery or a coffee shop, but he's like, hey, man, if this guy can do this, like, why the fuck can I can do it? You know Dude, what I mean? If I can do I literally say this all the time. I Like, anybody can do anything they want to do. Um, I can't remember. I have failed a lot in my day um, doing just about everything you could think of. But the times where I tried and gave it my all and tried 100% and like I could say that honestly, not telling myself that just to make somebody or myself feel better, but the times I've tried my hardest, uh, I've always been successful mm -hmm. or at least to some degree, right? Uh, but you talking about the, you know, things you want to do, um, yeah, I have a lot of ideas and things that 
are part of like what like my inner dialogue. Mm-hmm. Like I say that self to my in my head mm-hmm. all day long, and I'm like, oh, I just want to do this, and this would be really cool, and so on and so forth. But you know, the accountability thing, especially with um, with you doing the podcast, is nice because it takes that and moves that from your. I still consider like inner dialogue mm-hmm. to be like borderline like subconscious, mm-hmm. but it moves it from your subconscious to your consciousness. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh shit, I have said this that doesn't necessarily make you accountable. Maybe you find something else you want to do besides, you know, something you've talked about previously. Um, but I tell everybody, um, it just acts as a roadmap in some way. Yeah, but if you have an idea and it's, it's a, it's something that you can pull off and, and be authentic, um, do it. Don't hesitate. Even if you're just doing it a little bit, because you'll never know if you don't like it until you do it. Mm-hmm. You may not like it, you know. I mean, we were talking about doing stand up earlier. Like we both have done a try and open mics and stuff like that. You've obviously done a little bit bigger stuff, but like it's just like just having the cojones to get up there and do stuff like that is yeah. like in itself an achievement. <laughs> Even if you don't do well, you're like, like yeah, shit. That took like I'm I was scared up there a little yeah. bit. Like I felt like I was about to go to war. Like my heart was like pounding on my chest. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm about to like fight somebody right now. Yeah. And it's just I, I, actually I'm about to tell jokes. Yeah. You know, and it's just like. <laughs> Just yeah, but, so it's like, um, and, and you know, just the, the little bit that you and I have uh, spoken outside of, like I can tell that you're funny, um, especially in just little exchanges, you know. But the hardest thing, and like the, I remember my first open mic night that I did, uh, I got up there hoping that I was going to fail. And it was like a really easy way to like kind of sell myself short and mm-hmm. go, oh no, this is going to be terrible for me. <laughs> I always never want to do this again. And I got up there and I had like some little small successes, but then some failures. But then when you walk off stage, you're like, I fucking did it. Like, that's all that matters is that you did it. And so if you, I don't care if you write and you've never gotten up on stage, uh, you kind of never know. Like, maybe you don't like it. Maybe you get up there and you're up there for five minutes and you're like, this sucks. This is nothing like what I thought. Um, but you have to do it to, to know, you yeah. know. And then if you don't like it and you want to stop, then at least you know, I can stop wasting all this time going forward. And focus that like uh, mental energy on something else. Mm-hmm. You know, that's something I kind of have a issue with just on a personal level is that um, entertaining ideas or people or friends or people that I think are friends or something like that. You know, each person only has like a finite amount of min- energy, whether it's like emotional or physical or mental. And if you're putting that energy into the wrong spots, you got to kind of quickly ask yourself, like, what am I doing and how can I focus that on something that actually matters? I feel like, I mean, the time we invest in others is almost more important than the currency we invest in others because, like, at the end of the day, we're going to be dead. And it's like, this money is important to sustain life, but it's like, I feel like the most valuable thing I've learned in the past two years since I've lost all this weight and had this, like, complete, like, mental transformation was that... I need to spend it with people who are truly genuine and like not bullshitters and just like today's society there's so many people that are just so fake and I also want to bring people on here that are going to be genuine and be like willing to like talk about stuff like this and just be like hey like you know you got to put yourself out there and talk about experiences where they had to do that and because I mean for me I heard podcasts and they were just really influential and like Joe Rogan's probably the most influential for me because I was like, all right, if this dude that did Fear Factor can do stand-up comedy, and I know it takes lots of work and like do a podcast, but I was like, well, he these started are things. As, he started as a comedian, exactly. Yeah, and it's things that I know that I'm like passionate about. Like maybe I should try them at least, and then you know, like you said, if it doesn't work out, then I can at least at the end of the day be like, I tried. Yeah, and it it got to the point to where. I was just like, dude, I'm never going to do it if I don't try. And stand-up comedy was honestly one of the first things before I, like, I, was, I think I still weighed like 300 and... Are you serious? Well, I weighed 400 pounds. Holy shit, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So Congrats. I weighed... Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I've lost, I lost 225 pounds from April of 2018 to April of 2019. Mm-hmm. But like, I think April or May might have been of 2018 was the first time that I did stand-up. And I did an open mic at this place called Crumbs. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I walked off the stage and was like, dude, if you can do that, like, what can't you do? I was like, let's go! Isn't it crazy that even if, like, even if you're not good, you still feel that way? Yes, I was so like, empowered. Oh, I was like, dude, yeah. that failure just now, 
how boss do you feel? And yeah. I was like, I started applying that to so many things. And it was just so important in that moment of just failure, like you said. It's like I got up there and did it. And I did have good things. I had bad things. I mean, I think I did like seven or eight minutes my first time. Yeah. And, you know, I could definitely narrow that down and make it a lot better today. It's probably like a three-minute set. <laughs> right, right, But, right. like, then I was like, I've never done this. Like, and it just was so empowering and so important to my journey. And it's just, like, so silly to think, like, just doing stand-up comedy and doing an open mic would be that important. But it was just that – it was that domino that kind of just – What's – um, I think what – what got me with stand up was you have this game plan in mind or you have this idea of how it's going to go before you get on stage and i don't like so even in all the, like the training that i've had with like or education with public speaking or the engagements that i've had where i've had to speak openly like this podcast um i don't like reading from like a manuscript or an outline mm -hmm. So for me, I'll make like a few little notes or comments or just um, even like a half a sentence about a topic that I want to speak on. And I'll kind of arrange those in the order in which I want them to go. Uh, but when I get on stage, I'll set those notes down somewhere and I almost never look at them. Yeah. But the thing is, it's, it's kind of like a challenge. Um, and honestly, there are more moments where I wander into something that is not on the list uh, than not. And I'll be like, fuck, how did I get here? I wanted to say all this stuff. And now I'm like starting this joke and I've like missed these like few other punches that I had that were like probably really integral to like this next thing coming up. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. But the, one of the, I think the biggest takeaways aside from that too, is that like my humor is mostly self deprecating. Mm -hmm. So I just like, I'm just mostly just being honest with my bullshit and shitting on myself and people think it's funny and that's okay laugh at me I don't care everybody's got bullshit as someone uh, who used to be 400 pounds that is a huge part of my yeah. like this journey of being fat like the girls that used to hang out with me versus the girls that hang out <laughs> with me now is just like talk about that stuff and just yeah. like just yeah. self deprecation is like it just shows a vulnerability well it's, well, it's for me it's, it's even walking off a stage and feeling like I had a bad set it's liberating I feel like it's super like, therapeutic. Fuck, man. I feel great that I could, like, get out in front of all these people. Some of them I know, but a lot of them I don't. And, like, tell everybody and make, like, a mockery of, like, my shit. And people laugh and think it's funny. And then the realization is that nobody gives a fuck. They're just there to laugh. Mm -hmm. And I've made a point and, like, an effort in my, in my own, like, personal life, too, with my friends um, to be open with them and let them know, like hey I'm a terrible fucking person <laughs> like but I think that at least then you're not fake yeah I say that all people the time people see that man like everybody is the same everybody has shit everybody's awful but the person that's able to say that out loud and wear that on their sleeve I think people see that and they're like that dude's real like you know and I'd rather be that than be fake no I completely agree like I even with my podcast I always like try to reinforce that I'm not trying to be like some dude that you think is like this perfect person and you should follow all the things that I've done in life. I've fucked up so many Nobody times. Nobody is, man. Yeah. That's the thing. But I feel like I have a story that maybe can resonate and I want to help people to want to do stand-up comedy or yeah. want to start a business. And um, uh, we've been going for a minute, but I, 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 want to, I always try to end with like, what are your goals for the year? And then always ask like a question. But uh, so, what, yeah. what are, what's your big goal for the year as far as with this and uh, everything? Maybe even fitness, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we're still in the first quarter um, of 2020. Surprisingly, even though it feels like the year has been fleeting up to this point. Um, so obviously, I think we're about a re you know realistically about a week out from opening uh, Jefferson Street Coffee, and so oh, yeah. it's at 471 Jefferson Street, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, so that's the first and foremost. Once we get past that, uh, we'll look into kind of like expanding our, our wholesale accounts that we have currently. We'll probably do like a, a brand revisit and try to get everything kind of like um, uniform and solidified across the brand so that we can kind of keep continuing to push that nationally. Um, and then, yeah, I guess that's it from a business standpoint and just kind of get going and get the wheels turning and, and um, probably around the middle of the year kind of look at where we are and then kind of set some goals for where we want to go. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah. Um, and where can people find you as far as on social media and what's the location of your store? 
I know you said Jefferson Street, but what's the actual like address? Yeah, yeah. So um, stores were in Whole Foods out at Summit at Fritz Farm. We're in the Whole Foods in Rocky River, Ohio, if anyone in Ohio decides to listen to the podcast. Um, <laughs> Good Foods Co-op. And then once we open here in a week, uh, you can actually stop by and pick up, you know, and buy coffee here, point of sale uh, directly from the roastery. So that's going to kind of be a cool thing that um, that we have to offer people. I don't know that anyone currently has a roasting operation inside a coffee shop where you come in and you can see it. Like you're forced to interact with the production. Mm-hmm. So it just creates this like conversation. It's like, what is that thing right there? And it's like, that's the roaster. That's what we <laughs> roast the coffee on. Um, but... Um, yeah, social media. So Instagram, uh, Smoke and Aces Coffee, S M O K I N A C E S Coffee, all one word. And then we'll fire up a Facebook page specifically for Jefferson Street Coffee, uh, which will be our retail location. And there will be kind of like some, um, you know, they're kind of synonymous right now. Um, but because it's a physical location and Smoke and Aces really isn't um, technically, uh, we'll probably push more people to Jefferson Street Coffee. And then it's kind of cool if we ever decide to open up another brick and mortar, uh, we can name that um, based on the geography mm-hmm. rather than calling it Smoke and Aces. Like, um, a lot of people have asked that too, why we chose to name the shop Jefferson Street Coffee. And I'm like, well, because if you're having a conversation with a few other people and they're like, oh, what'd you do today? You're like, oh, I was down at Smoking Aces Coffee. And then they'll go, well, like, where's that at? And they're like, it's at the corner of 5th and Jefferson. And then they still go, well, where's that at? Yeah. It's like this weird gap that, like, nobody can reference. Mm-hmm. So at least if you say Jefferson Street Coffee, they're like, oh, it must be on Jefferson Street. Yeah, yeah, you for know? sure. So, and it gives us some, um, some versatility going forward. We can name the next place, um, you know, based on its geography. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah. That adds a versatility to it, and it's cool for sure. Yeah. Just like you said, this is over by West Six and by uh, County Club, two of my mm-hmm. favorite local yeah. businesses too. Same. Um, so this is definitely a cool little area that I'm really excited about, and also Blue Stallions over there. Um, so yeah, this is a, a I love this area of town. It's expanding, and then also you got everything with the Rock House Brewery. Yeah, and. Minton's, I love that place actually. But. Yeah, Minton's is pretty legit. Um, there's a lot of bang for your buck over here. Um, North Lime's kind of growing. True. Yeah. Um, we would be, I think, in our location, what I would refer to as like an inadvertent infill strategy. Mm-hmm. So like there's there is this gap between Green Lantern on Third and Jefferson, and then Sixth uh, and Jefferson where County Club and West Six are. So uh, the big warehouse that's right next to us, I think, is actually owned by Transylvania. Uh, and then Transylvania has actually bought a section of uh, uh, Cool Oven Park back here, and they're going to build some uh, tennis courts and a parking lot or whatever. I think that's mostly for students. Uh, but one other cool thing is like our building is where the Legacy Trail ends, so like the trail picks up right outside. So we'll have like a couple bike racks out here on the side uh, for people to kind of like um, you know park and grab a coffee if they want to, mm-hmm. and then continue on out to Georgetown or down Fifth Street out to wherever it ends on the other side of town. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of cool to be a part of that. Um, and then we've got the awesome mural on the side. I don't yeah, know if you've seen that, that uh, Alexandria Pang did um, for uh, Prohibition. So it's the the Red Fox, which if you're a comedy fan, Red Fox. It's one of the greats. And so I, that's why I tell people why <laughs> we did that. So, But um, yeah, man, do you have like a closing mission statement or just like something you want to... St- close with as far as like for what you want to do like what's the like what do you like what what makes you do what you're doing and what's your like advice to other people um i think i do it because i can't not do it so if you have a i guess a burning desire or passion to do something just do it and i think if you're authentic about it people will pick up on it and um you know you can you can be successful that way but in the in the instance that you're that you have to do something that you really don't want to do you're just going to be miserable So, you know, life's about taking chances, man. So just take as many as you can and fail as as often as you possibly can. Dude, I appreciate it so much. Uh, We are here at Jefferson Street Coffee. This we have a cup right now. What is it? Uh, this is our uh, Colombian that the we Colombian. do. It's the Casa Vieja. Which, okay. Yeah, that's on shelves everywhere. All right. Well, I appreciate it so much, man. Uh, this has been an awesome experience, and I can't wait till you all open up. Uh, thank you so much. And if you're listening to the What the Shuck podcast, thank you so much. Uh, make sure you subscribe, make sure you share, make sure you like, 
this whole community thing is really important. So I just want to make sure that people know that this is going on. But also, I want to find new guests and people to bring on because the whole point of this is to build a community and just to make not only Lexington better, but all of Kentucky. Uh, so thank you all so much, and don't forget to live the dream.